I've done Anki every day since 2009. I scored 270 in step one, honored all my 3D shelf exams, but then I didn't have to study much for step two, step three, and four out of my five anesthesia board exams that I took thereafter. Anki can be a life-changing technique. In this video, you'll learn the top three mistakes that med students make using Anki and how you can overcome them to transform your career and your scores. Stick around until the end where I'll discuss what I did with my Anki reviews on my wedding day, my honeymoon, and every day of every single major exam I took. Let's jump in. The biggest mistake that I see students make using Anki is, is that they use it to memorize things as opposed to reinforcing deeper concepts. Now we've talked in the past about how step one and step two and shelf exams all emphasize the application of fundamental science principles. Anki can be great for this, but the problem is, is that if you use Anki just to memorize things, it can reinforce really bad habits that can end up tanking your scores later for the US families and shelf exams. I'm gonna give you some examples of some cards that will illustrate how Anki cards are typically made and how these things can be detrimental to your studying. So the first card is epidural hematoma caused by rupture of what? And the answer is middle meningeal artery. The second card would be epidural hematoma, what's the classic presentation? Lucid period followed by rapid deterioration. So the downsides of this approach are threefold. One, it's really inefficient. If I have to make cards for every single individual fact, I will end up making many, many more cards than necessary. A consequence of having to make so many cards is, is that Anki can be really overwhelming. If you find yourself buried in Anki and not having enough time to do other things like Cubane questions or practice tests, or even just having time to yourself, then you may be suffering from the consequences of having cards that tend to be more memorization heavy. The final issue of having memorization heavy Anki cards is that if you don't understand it well when you're making and reviewing the card, you're also not going to understand it well on your test. And since the US MLEs require you to understand and apply deeper concepts, if you have just superficial understanding because you've memorized a bunch of facts on some Anki cards, then it's going to really make it difficult for you to do better on the exams. So instead of just memorizing everything as if it's a fact, a better way of making Anki cards is to actually understand a core concept and apply that to connect as many things together that have a logical relationship. Let me give you an example of what that would look like. In this card, it says epidural hematoma, use the pathophysiology to explain the classic presentation. The back would say something like rupture of a high pressure middle meningeal artery, which leads to rapid over the course of hours progression with signs of neurologic deterioration like headache, confusion, drowsiness, or loss of consciousness. Note that there's a lot of concepts here. One of the concepts is that arteries have a higher pressure than veins. Because they have a higher pressure than veins, then you would expect that an arterial bleed would expand faster, and thus you would have progression of the symptoms much faster than, say, a venous bleed like you would get in the subdural hematoma. Note that I took the exact same two facts and I just connected them together by using a simple concept to explain the relationship between the two. Because I did that, let's look at the three benefits that I gained. First, it's actually much more efficient. I used half as many cards to explain the same number of facts. Second, because I have fewer cards and because I'm gonna remember those cards better, Anki will become much, much less overwhelming. And then number three, because I understand these facts so much better, I now will be able to answer any related question much more easily on my exam. So let me give you an example of what this would look like. So in this vignette, we have a 27 year old male who's admitted to the hospital following a bar fight during which he has sustained a blow to the head with the glass bottle, right? So we know that it was a, a focal trauma which is oftentimes what you see in someone who has middle meningeal artery injury. So he was initially alert and oriented, but has become increasingly lethargic. This would be signs of general cerebral cortex dysfunction, right? The concept here is, is that your brain is not working as well, right? So alertness is a sign of cerebral cortex function. And so if you have dysfunction, because say you've got some large amount of blood that's pooling and it's pushing on the cerebral cortex and decreasing its function, then you might be lethargic, you might be lightheaded or any other sort sorts of decrease in alertness. Neurological examination shows left-sided hemiparesis and a fixed dilated right pupil. This is a sign of cranial nerve three dysfunction because now it's being compressed because of an increase in pressure intracranially. A biconvex lens-shaped mass that is not crossing the suture line. Which of the following is the most immediate complication? So if you've seen any of our previous videos on how to analyze a question, you'll know that the question that they're actually asking can almost always be simplified into something that is much more easy to answer. So the question here isn't really asking in a guy that's got hit by a bottle in a bar fight and you see all these things on CT scan and you have increasing lethargy and other neurological signs, what would be the most likely 
likely next complication, right? If you have all of those details there, it's going to be very difficult to answer the question. Instead, because we have spent our time learning the underlying concepts, we can peel back those layers and try to understand what the fundamental concept is that they're testing. We call this the standalone question, which means I don't need to know all the details from the vignette in order to answer it effectively. Here would be something like, what happens from a rapidly increasing intracranial mass? The answer is going to be the same. Really, it should be something like herniation. So why is it that herniation would make more sense in this context? What we've just illustrated is that if you take the time to really understand things and put them together on your Anki cards, in this case, the fact that you've got a middle meningeal artery rupture, which is a high pressure system, which is going to lead to a rapid accumulation of blood, that higher pressure, faster progressing bleed that you would have in an epidural hematoma is going to cause a herniation much more quickly. I don't have to have necessarily learned that in order to use the underlying principle to explain why that would make sense above something, say, like meningitis or above any of the other answers that are here. If you love understanding things and hate memorizing random facts, then be sure to hit the like and subscribe button so that you can learn the why behind the most important USMLE concepts. Mistake number two is relying exclusively on using pre-made Anki decks. As long as electronic resources have been around, there's been a collective desire to try to find ways of saving time of making our own resources and using other pre-made resources. So Anki is no different. Because it takes so long to make Anki cards, there is a very strong desire to just try and go online and find some version of an Anki deck that promises to take everything that we had hoped to do and find that resource resource and use that rather than doing it ourselves. The idea is, is that instead of spending all that time making our own cards, we can just spend time learning it and then have extra time to do questions and other things. Some people do use these decks and do very, very well. And so we think, oh my gosh, well, they, I've seen other people use these decks. And so I should use these decks too if I want to do well on my exams. Now, there are three issues with using pre-made deck. The first is, is that oftentimes with a pre-made deck, they tend to be more of the memorization and fact-based cards that we discussed in our first mistake. The second issue is, is that just because there are some people that do well using these resources doesn't mean that the resources themselves were the cause. Correlation doesn't equal causation. This gets to the idea of what we call silent evidence. So silent evidence means that if you only look at the people that did well using a particular resource and you ignore all the people that didn't do well and that dropped out, and you only find the people that stuck with it to, to the very end and who did well in their tests, and so we're talking about it on things like Reddit or YouTube or in these you know, panels of students that they have at schools, then you're going to ignore the critical evidence, which suggests that there's a lot of people that try doing this and don't do very well. The third issue is, is that even if you could avoid memorizing a bunch of random facts using the cards, you tend to do better if you can actually make your own cards. Now let's think about this. In college, or in high school, if you saw someone who did really well on their exam and they took excellent notes, do you think that just by reading their notes and without making your own notes that you could do just as well as they did on the test? Probably not. One of the major benefits of using Anki and just studying in general is having to put the information together in the first place. And so the act of making cards, yes, it does take a lot of time, but it's not really making cards that's taking the time. In many cases, it's really the fact that you have to to learn the information well in the first place in order to make good cards. Now, there probably are some cards that you could use that are more memorization. So pharmacology tends to be things that you do have to memorize. And as long as you start with a useful deck that's forcing you to make connections, you probably don't need to make all of the cards on your own. I would say though, that for the majority of information, it is going to be better for you to make your own cards. The other major benefit of making your own is that you can focus on your biggest weaknesses. Most decks are going to cover everything equally, and so they're going to overemphasize some things that you're going to know well, and they're going to underemphasize others that you probably need more work. Are you feeling overwhelmed with Anki or anything else with your USMLE studying? If so, let us know in the comments. We take your questions and requests and use that as the basis for our future videos. So if there's anything that you want to know about, be sure to let us know below. Mistake number three is that people don't use Anki every single day. One of the things that is really tough is that after a long week or after you've just finished an exam, you don't want to really do more work. And so it's natural in those situations to say, oh, 
I can't do any more Anki cards. Now there are three issues with not using Anki every single day. The first issue is that Anki works best the more that you do it. There's a mathematical equation that shows what the maximum that you can accumulate of something. And all you need to know is how much you gain of that thing on top divided by what percentage you're going to lose of that thing every single day. What that means is regardless of what that top number is of how many things you learn per day, because the denominator is so low, the theoretical maximum of things that you could learn is nearly infinite. Practically what this means is, is that the longer that you do Anki, the more that you can accumulate that knowledge. The second thing that you wanna remember is that you should do your cards every single day. Again, it's a lot easier to do things 100% of the time than 99%. I've taken this to the logical conclusion, which is that even on my wedding day, even on every day of my honeymoon, the day that my daughter was born, and even on the days that I came back from taking USMLE step one, step two, and step three, I actually did my flashcards. And the reason is, is that it was a lot easier for me to just say, I will always do my cards rather than saying, hmm, today, uh, is today gonna be my exception day? There are things that you can do to make it easier to do cards if you know that you have an important event. Like for example, you can study ahead. So I can do cards in advance. So for example, before my wedding, I did most of my cards the day or week before that. And so I only had a small number of cards that I had to do that day. But regardless, I still committed to doing my cards every single day. So what's the solution to this? You want to embrace the fact that Anki works best if you do it over a long period of time. And particularly if you're not going to stop doing cards, even if you've moved on to a new subject. So for an example, I've made about 20,000 cards in my life up until this point. It takes me maybe 30 minutes to do the 110 cards that I have to do every day. That's remarkable. Think about that. I only have to study about 30 to 45 minutes every single day to recall the nearly 20,000 things that I've put into cards starting in 2009, my first year at Stanford, through my residency at the Harvard MGH program, and then every year thereafter. If you just continue to hold on to the information that you have in the past, there is a remarkable amount that you can retain. Anki can be a completely life-changing thing, and I hope that you can realize just how powerful it can be as a tool in your armamentarium. If you're seeking strategies to further enhance your USMLE studies so you can get higher scores in less time, be sure to check out these related videos. We'll see you in the next one.